Welcome to the Coming Home Well podcast, the show that educates, supports, and advocates for the veteran community. Your host, Dr. Tyler Piron, U.S. Army retired, will bring you exciting conversations with amazing guests about resources, research, and military history, all geared to helping our warriors to come home well. Here's your host, Dr. Tyler Piron. Welcome back to Coming Home Well. I'm your host, Tyler Piron. And today we have again, Paul Dillon, who is going to answer some of these questions and some of these concerns. He's been dealing with a lot of things out. He's so involved with veteran organizations. But one of the interesting things that he's been working on, and this is a purely veteran, but it, it's across the gamut, the Kennedy Forum on Mental Health. And I said, what the heck is that? So I wanted to talk with Paul about it, find out what it is find out what they're doing, and and talk about it in the context of veterans. So, Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Tyler, and thanks for having me back. So what is the Kennedy Forum on Mental Health? Well, first of all, I want to say that throughout this podcast that I, I am not a psychologist or a clinician not in any way, sense, or, or form. And it's important for those that have mental health issues to get help to see a clinician, which I am not. So I'm not offering psychological advice here. I'm just telling you what my experience has been with the with the Kennedy Forum. And also, I, I did serve nine years as a trustee of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, which is the oldest and largest independent nonprofit graduate school of psychology in the nation, serving some 6,000 students at campuses across the United States. And I also had a very unique experience in serving as a three-year term as a public member and commissioner on the National Commission on Case Manager Certification, which certifies more than 50,000 case managers in the United States in the physical and mental health areas, in addition to uh, social services. So Mm -hmm. I've had some professional experience with this, but again, I'm not a psychologist or clinician. More in the management side, making sure things are running well and and getting it, getting it out to the people. Right. You asked what the Kennedy Forum is, and it's a national nonprofit organization that was formed by former U.S. Congressman Patrick A. J. Kennedy in 2013 to erase the stigma of mental illness in the United States and to ensure mental health parity so that mental health is treated in the same way as physical health for reimbursement by insurance companies. And Patrick started this organization in 2013. I've been involved with him since the start of the organization, and actually before this, before that time, and helping him to represent the services of this organization to the veteran community. So let's let's just pause for a minute and let's talk about the the use of mental health and, and the insurance companies treating it with on parity with physical issues. I mean, because Definitely, there was a lot of things that were different and what they would cover, how much they would cover, things like that. So if you were looking to get mental health care, was it not covered? Was it more expensive? What was the deal? Well, here you have to understand with veterans is two-thirds of veterans get their health care outside of the VA because they're employed. They get it through their employers. And so veterans need to understand and civilians need to understand that under the 2008 Mental Health Parity Act, insurance companies must pay for mental health treatment in the same way that they pay for physical health. So if your insurance company, corporate insurance company, doesn't pay for mental health treatment, you better look into that issue. Mm -hmm. And if you can go to the Kennedy Forum website, which, you know, it's kennedyforum.org, you're going to put this on your site. You, there are tools for you to look at this and file a complaint or whatever and see what's going on. But insurance companies under the law of the land, the Mental Health Parity Act of 2008, must pay for mental health treatment in the same way 
that they pay for physical health. We're beginning to understand now that the mind is a part of the body. Yeah, I've always and- noticed like when you go to the dentist, the coverage sucks. You have to pay half. Whereas if I was having a broken arm or something, I'd pay a copay, right. like 20 or 80 bucks to go to the emergency right. room or something. Right. But if you go to the dentist, it's horrible. And I imagine prior to this law, mental health coverage was probably pretty similar if they covered it all. Otherwise, it'd be like, you're on your own, buddy. That's right. And 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 so uh, veterans or civilians, anybody, this, this applies to certainly civilians as well as veterans, need to understand that it needs to be, mental health needs to be paid the same way and look into it mm-hmm. if it isn't. Right. And yeah. most of them are covered by state and they're, they're not freewheeling. A lot of them, they're very regulated, but it used to be a big barrier to access. Even if you had health insurance to be able to get mental health care and right. this helped remove one of those barriers, but there's a lot of other barriers. A lot of it seeming to do with how well is mental health accepted in the service and out of the service. Now I've seen seismic changes out of the service where People go and see therapists and things like that, and it's not even a big deal. But at the same time, it's sort of still a stigma a stigma in a lot of areas because they don't want to be looked on as that guy or gal. What was it like when you were in service? Because you were a, a little bit before me, and I, I'd be curious to hear your perspective. If somebody was having some mental health challenges, depression or anxiety or PTSD, how was that treated when you were in service? It, it wasn't. I mean, post traumatic stress didn't even be, it didn't even become a field of study until 1980. Mm-hmm. I left Vietnam in, in April of '71. I knew that there was a VA. We were never directed to it, and there was just nothing. So mm-hmm. we've we've come. I mean. And I mentioned this to to you in previous podcasts on employment and entrepreneurship. We've come light years in acknowledging these types of issues for veterans and ensuring that there's care for them. And I think mm-hmm. it's an interesting statistic that the vast majority of veteran suicides are in the 65 at age and up group. And that has certainly changed. I they're mean, my, they're my age, oh, yeah. And because we never had. I mean, there was just there was just nothing, and so we have come a long way in in recognizing mental health issues for active duty military in the service. But we need to do a lot more. We've and, been at war for twenty years, and there's a lot of baggage that sort of comes along with that. People are exposed to some horrible things. And everybody handles it differently. And some people have more of a challenge than others. And that's okay because everybody's different. But we're talking about some serious challenges. It could be, and, and a lot of times it's undiagnosed PTSD or other related mental health issues that can be resolved with treatment. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. And we need to understand, and I think we're getting there. In, mm-hmm. the, in the military and veteran community that is the weak soldier, the weak sailor, the weak army person, the weak Marine, the weak civilian who hides it and, and puts their buddies, their units, their communities, their families in danger. It's the strong service person, the strong veteran, the strong civilian who goes out and seeks help. And that takes courage. Yeah. And integrity to recognize something isn't right. That's right. And to say, Hey, I need some help. And these are not moral failings. They are not failings of character. They are diseases. Mm -hmm. Just like cancer is a disease, just like heart disease is a disease just like diabetes is a disease you're not embarrassed to go get treatment for diabetes or heart issues you shouldn't be embarrassed to get 
treatment for mental health issues. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that things have changed in perspective. And, and we've talked a little bit about the change in the law, but we've also seen a pretty seismic change in the way the VA and the mental health services within the military are trying to adapt to the increase of demand. Uh, demand signals, again, a huge issue. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think we're coming a long way in, in doing that. Patrick Kennedy has this wonderful phrase that I think sums things up very well, that when we go in for our physical, we should get a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I've I, seen that know, at the VA, actually. They've started they, to ask a number of questions they, on they the do. semi-annual physical. Right. They do. When I go in for my, for my semi-annual physical, they go over a list of questions. And, and I always applaud them for that, saying, boy, those are the right questions to ask. And, and I'm so thankful that you, that you do ask those questions. So I, I think we've come a long way. I think, though, that we have to put things in perspective, like with post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. The VA has estimated that it's between 11% and 20% of the service people coming back from the recent wars have post-traumatic stress. Somewhere in there, I've heard various numbers. It's 7 8% of the general population is post-traumatic stress. So it's not, it isn't everybody, mm -hmm. but for those who have substance abuse, post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, other mental health issues, go out and get treatment because treatment is there for you. Every time they ask those questions, I, it, and it reminds me of the same questions with the post-deployment surveys. And, and if you answer them wrong, you don't get to go home. You have to go talk to somebody. You have to do all those things. So everyone just like straight lines, all the no answers, just so that they can get out of the, the end processing of deployment. So you can go on leave or, or whatever you're going to go do. But if you're like, yeah, I actually had a hard time or yeah, I've been drinking too much or fill in the blank. And then all of a sudden you realize oh, gee, I'm going to be here for another week or whatever long. So everyone doesn't answer them honestly, even though they know they've been having problems. And then they realize later, oh, geez, I should, I need help, which is right. great to ask for help. That's but right. when you're at the doctor and they're asking you those questions, that is the time to address it. If you're having more immediate challenges, definitely go make an appointment, go do whatever. Right, and, and there's and we're going to talk about some of the hotlines if you're having a crisis, but if you can take care of these issues when you recognize them, they don't morph into really bad, terrible, horrible crises where you you're just so out of of whack that then it takes a lot more to get you back into the right headspace and timing. Right, and so take care of it, man. And there's no, like I said, it's not a moral failing, mm -hmm. shouldn't be embarrassed. It's a disease and, and treat it like one and go get help. And again, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a psychologist. Go to a professional for this. But I, I, I can tell you from all the readings and research I've done that it is an issue. It is treatable or the symptoms can at least be alleviated and and you can go on from there and many people once they've gone through treatment experience post-traumatic growth mm -hmm. they are actually can go out and do things that they hadn't been able to do before so it's so important to get help and it's so important not to hide it and it's so important not to be embarrassed, go out and, and, and seek treatment. I mean, it's just, it's so critical. It really is. A lot of times soldiers and sailors or service members, when they're having challenges, they go out and do dumb things. They get drunk, they get a DUI, they get in a fight or domestic violence or pick, pick a thing that gets them in trouble and they end up in the court system. 
And there's been some pretty significant changes over the last 20 years and how a lot of courts are now dealing with veterans. That's right. And there's a whole number of what's known as veteran treatment courts. They're modeled after drug treatment courts. Because from my study of this and my talking with people on this issue, we can understand that what I read about veteran treatment courts just locking somebody up doesn't isn't going to solve the problem. In fact, it, it could make it worse. Mm-hmm. So a veteran goes into the treatment courts and for first-time offenders, they are, they're under supervision. They get counseling and and they can come out and and continue on with with their lives in many instances. I I took a look and it looks like there's about 500 of these courts spread around the country. And and again, their recognition, just like drug treatment courts, that we need to solve the basic underlying issues and locking people up just doesn't, doesn't do that. We've got taking care of the underlying issues like the mental health or drug abuse. And then all of a sudden, you have a person who is always following the law and uh, before and after, but you know, while they're in the throes of whatever they're dealing with, they're, they're doing something that brings them to the attention of the authorities. It sounds like a lot better way to deal with the issue instead right. of uh, doing hard time. And right. then you come out and you've still got the same issues. These programs, these veteran treatment courts involved, uh, regular court appearances, intensive supervision, and support services such as counseling, health care, education, and job training. And each state and locality may have some different criteria for eligibility and may offer some different types of services and support. But the overarching goal of all of these veteran treatment courts is to provide treatment and support to veterans who have encountered legal trouble as, as a result of their uh, service-related challenges. So mm-hmm. uh, it's certainly a big step in the right direction. No, it's a huge issue. These justice-involved veterans, I guess that's the terminology these days. Right. It's a lot better to force that as a forcing function to get help and treatment and drug abuse and get help for the PTSD. The VA has some exceptional treatment capabilities for PTS and for other mental health issues. They've really grown over the last 20 years. It's not perfect. You're never going to hear me tell you the VA is perfect and they've done everything right, but they're doing a lot of research and they have a lot of clinicians out there. So if you want to talk to somebody, it may take a little while. I get it. There's backlogs depending on where you are. uh, There's such a demand for mental health treatment these days that the number of providers is limited. I right. get it. But right. if you get the ball started before it's crisis, you hopefully avoid the crisis further on down the road. It takes right. some it takes some courage, it takes some strength and it takes some insight into who you are to recognize this. And we need to break the silence over mm-hmm. this issue because I can't emphasize enough. It is not a moral failing. You know, it's not your a moral character fit. It's a disease. Yeah. Know? And we need to break that silence that these diseases are treatable, or at least the symptoms can be alleviated. So you mentioned something earlier that I thought was interesting, is that most of the veterans who are committing suicide, taking their own lives, are older. And, and I've always pictured it, the younger, impulsive folks, the 18 to 24-year-olds, that are just getting out, getting frustrated, things like that. But apparently most of the folks now are older, 65 and up. That's what I read, and that's what I understand. Mm -hmm. And most of those attempts from suicide, from what I read and understand, are are with weapons. So I can't overemphasize gun safety and locking them up and and not having access to them if you if you have any I, proclivity towards suicide ideation i mean just get rid of that gun and but from the statistics that i read and i i hope that i'm right that most of the veteran suicide is 
the older age group. You know? mm -hmm. And that's just a tragedy. I think you, we, the ones that are in the news are, are the younger people and, and, and that's what you hear about. I don't mean to talk about this in such a clinical way because Tyler, one is too many. Oh yeah. One is too many. I see arguments about how many, 17 a day, 20 a day, one, one is too many. And we've got to work towards getting that one to zero. And I think, I think progress is really being made. The country is really, from what I see, coming around to understanding mm -hmm. uh, mental health is a main issue. So, Paul, if someone is in crisis or they're having a hard time, what should they do? Crisis hotline, 988. And that's Crisis. new. And, that's and new, that's, right. Yeah, it's new. Yeah, like, right. instead of 911, right. you just hit 988 on right. your phone, which and is press, amazing. Right, and press 1 if you're a veteran. Mm -hmm. And do it, do it. I mean, don't hesitate. If you, if you yourself are in crisis or you know of somebody who is, dial that number right away and get help. And then also take a look at the Kennedy Forum website, kennedyforum.org, and take a look at the tools that are available to you there. It will educate you on, on mental health issues, but also point you towards tools that are helpful for you for uh, if you have problems with mental health parity or, or other types of issues. So take a look at that site. It's a good basic site to go to and for veterans and 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 see what you can find to help you we've been talking with paul dylan paul thank you so much for sharing with us about the parity act i wasn't even aware of that i guess i was looking at it the other day and i was trying to like oh i didn't realize that it used to not be treated the exact same way because let's face it i've been in tricare my whole life i joined the army when i was 17 I've never had private health insurance, so I, why would I know about it? And then I started digging into it, and I said, wow, it is pretty amazing that you know mental health care was like, oh, yeah, we don't cover that. You could have cancer. You could have brain surgery. You could have all sorts of things. Oh, but, oh, mental health, oh, we're not going to really cover that. Or we'll cover it like at 20% of the normal cost compared to everything else or whatever they were choosing to do, and they, they were allowed to do that. Right. That's just crazy to me. Right. And it was Patrick Kennedy who sponsored this in the House. And quite interestingly, his father mm -hmm. sponsored it in the Senate. So this is really something which is very at the heart of the Kennedy Forum. And I have to, I have to, Patrick's been a good friend for a number of years, but I have to really point out that he has done so much for mental health uh, mm -hmm. in this nation and he's really brought it to the fore as has as an important issue he solicited many ce celebrities to point this out as an issue he's brought it greatly to the national attention and he's a wonderful he's a gentleman if you ever get a chance to meet him or work with him. It's really an honor and a pleasure. And, and, but he has really led this initiative in the United States. And I'm very, very pr proud of him. Paul, thank you so much for joining us on Coming Home Well. Thank you, Tyler. And again, please post the 988 number on the site and the Kennedy Forum. We sure uh, will. Website on the site. And again, I'm not a clinician. So go seek somebody who really is a psychologist and, and can help you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks for joining us this week on Coming Home Well with Dr. Tyler Pieron. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. Thanks again. And until all are home and all are well, this is Coming Home Well. Coming home well.